Hi, my name is Blake, and I have just a quick note before we get started. Actually, it's more like a recommendation, because this podcast is an immersive audio experience. Part fact, part fantasy. It's best that you listen with headphones on, imagination on, and everything else turned off. Welcome to Abandoned, the All-American Ruins podcast. Season 2, Episode 8. Mrs. Dalby and the Gravekeeper of Hatteras Island. As my body drifts through a seaside graveyard in Hatteras, a southern wispy town on the outer banks of North Carolina, I think about the practice of wandering. I've spent much of the past year inside several abandoned spaces strewn across the country, this particular expedition at the end of March being one of the most important, because it marks the first time venturing out into the world virtually unafraid, because dose number one is in my arm. Pfizer. Files fully Pfizered, I threaten, will be a tank top I make and wear all summer. Though it's not a threat at all, my friends and family would expect as much. For example, they just nodded their heads politely when I told them about my idea to make t-shirts that had award-winning actresses' names on them. Kate Blanchett, Michelle Yao, Viola Davis, Nicole Kidman, Halle Berry, Glenn Close, etc. I've been so desperate for wanderlust to make me feel alive again. I plan, meticulously, to take this drive from the Catskills to the Outer Banks. I will shack up in a bungalow on Hatteras, one barrier island of many in the makeshift archipelago. At the southernmost tip of the island, my car meets the sea, and though the map says that the next island down isn't too far away, it's just far enough that I'm unable to see it without my specs on. The following morning, I walk down North Carolina State Highway 12, one headphone in, the harmonies of Crosby, Stills, and Nash burrowing into my skull, boldly caroling. It's getting to the point where I'm no fun anymore. I am sorry. Sometimes it hurts so badly, I must cry out loud that I am lonely. I am yours. You are mine. You are what you are. You make it hard. I breathe the salt water air. I can't stop thinking about how much I miss the sound of New York City. Or rather, the sound I imagined would be New York City when I was a kid daydreaming about the skyline as if it were right outside my bedroom window in the foothills of Colorado Springs. Before I couldn't afford to live there anymore, in New York City or Colorado Springs. But then it became Manhattan, the original American pandemic graveyard where the virus first made landfall and courageously pulled a riptide over all five boroughs of New York City. Where for months, each and every night, the bells, whistles, pots and pans of residents hanging out their windows and off their fire escapes rang out into the sunset to honor the army of essential workers who put their lives on the line to ensure that society can continue to function at its current unsustainable pace. We have to keep making money, you guys. I heard a guy on the subway say while well, on my first subway ride after the start of the pandemic. We just have to.
And then there's this graveyard, the one I've just walked into quite by accident. This morning's walk is designed to trace my footsteps on the inlet peninsula that overlooks the crab spawning sanctuary. The headstones seem to appear out of the dense air that I embrace. The sun peeks its head out, then turtle shells back regularly, but the day feels wet, as it would on a mid-Atlantic island in the spring. And there they are. Low, marshy graves. A pebbles toss from the elongated Frisco beach which stretches up and down the NC-12. I've been meandering through this pasture of buried bones for less than 30 seconds when the sun finally permanently peeks out from behind an evaporating cloud bank and reveals a small, crumbling cottage in the distance, about 300 yards or so from where I'm standing. With caution, I carefully glide towards the two-story structure. I reach a grove of trees that conceals me from view, and I see that, indeed, the shanty is vacant and decrepit. It's impossible to see it from the highway because the front is enveloped in thick brush, forcing the house to mirage into the landscape. I float to the front of this strange ruin, looking for a way in, and find an entrance with a tilted porch. As I pass through the rickety door with ease, my imagination ignites. I fall back in time. It's 1955. The gravekeeper's hut stands tall, humble, in the shadow of the vengeful waves crashing onto the shore fifty paces from here. A place of sorrow, where the gravekeeper and his wife have spent the last year burying victims of a new virus called polio. Once the Public Health Service authorizes its release, the polio vaccine can begin to protect American youngsters. In 1955, over 10 million children received one or more injections of self-vaccine, including this boy. I pass into the front room and hear him murmuring softly as Dwight D. Eisenhower speaks on the radio, talking about the dangers of public education. I start to laugh at the idea that the centralization of public education could lead the country into communism, then immediately slap my hand over my mouth, afraid I've been caught. The gravekeeper doesn't budge, because he doesn't hear me. I don't need to tiptoe, I realize. I am a ghost to him, too. In the next room, I hear the crackle of eggs and bacon in a frying pan. I hear a woman humming as she scrambles, flips, and scrapes the food onto plates. I'm instantly hungry. Can ghosts eat? Who is this woman? Mrs. Dalby. The man shouts. The woman pokes her head around the corner. Food is ready, Mr. Dalby. Mr. Dalby. Husband and wife. Got it. The son of the mid-morning bristles onto the breakfast table as Mrs. Dalby, as the gravekeeper calls his wife pours a new cup of coffee for Mr. Dalby, as Mrs. Dalby calls her husband. We sit. I'm confused about why I'm able to sit in a chair, but I don't argue with my imagination. We eat in silence. I feel uncomfortable, and I don't know why. I go to make conversation and ask questions, but every word that tumbles out of my mouth evaporates. After what feels like an eternity of thinking of exactly what I want to say to them, breakfast is over, and the gravekeeper is out back tending to new plots. That's when I hear someone crying. I can't tell where it's coming from, so I begin to search. I head upstairs, slowly, and see a small, dimly lit bedroom with a chair in the corner, tattered pink upholstery. I marvel at the remnants of human life just left behind, sitting to rot, the eyes of the world turned away, mostly, as nature makes room for deterioration and eventual digestion by the surface of the earth. Which will happen to all of us at some point anyway. A voice intrudes from the darkness. Because 
If we don't perpetuate our own extinction first, which will happen, the sun will swallow us anyway. My face gets hot as my neck gets cold and goosebumps protrude fiercely up and down my spine. I peer harder into the dark corner of the bedroom. And even if that didn't happen, which it will, in four billion years, the Milky Way galaxy will collide with the Andromeda galaxy, the result of an inevitable crash course, and anything humanity ever did, made or thought, will cease to exist. Light slowly rises from a dark corner as daylight pours through the holes in the wall. I freeze to the floor as a figure appears coming from sit to stand, starting from its clogged shoes, up the bundled legs and thick brown skirt, past the modest torso, and up the sun-soaked neck and shoulders to reveal the gravekeeper's wife. I hold my breath in my hands as I let out a whisper. Mrs. Dalby, I presume. Speak up, boy. Whenever I'm presented with the options of flight, fight, or freeze, I unintentionally choose freeze. Almost always. Every once in a while, flight comes into play when I need to get away from physical harm. I said, speak up. I open my mouth and words tumble out, all blended together. I I thought I heard someone crying. I pause. Finally, after what feels like hours of waiting, she obliges our conversation. I was crying. I feel sad today. What of it? And who are you? She steps closer. I feel warmth vibrating from her skin, and I see a glow shining in her ferocious blue eyes. My body relaxes, slowly, as I tell her my name, where I'm from, and why I'm here. And then it dawns on me. Wait, you can see me? You feel so real. So do you. And here I was beginning to think I was losing my sanity. (laughs) (laughs) I glance around the room, tattered and torn. Like what we've done with the place? Yes, I do. But it makes me a little sad. Also, I'm trespassing. Trespassing? I abandoned it decades ago after Mr. Dalby died. I had no reason to stay here. You're welcome here. I'm astonished. My world feels smaller and more expansive at the same time. My face goes pale. I might have been mistaken. I might actually be talking to a real ghost. Yes, dear, I am a ghost. My name is Mrs. Lillian Dalby, and my husband is Mr. Charles Dalby, and we used to live here. I ease into our new friendship, taking a step into the room when Mrs. Dalby interrupts. Want to see the most beautiful thing I've ever made? She snaps her fingers, and the room goes dark. Out of nowhere, millions and billions and trillions of stars light up the decaying ceiling, circling the bedroom. The air gets hot as the waves crash on the shoreline outside, and everything that ever existed seems to congregate into this small room. It all starts to spin. Mrs. Dalby motions to me as the room twirls. She invites me to sit on her shoddy pink chair, and I do, and I feel her hands land softly on my shoulders. My body becomes light, clouds and I forget my fear of dying. As she wraps her arms around me, I start to cry. Saltwater tears, bound for the Atlantic. I'm millions and billions and trillions of light years away, a comet rattling across the sky, watching time become a ball of white light in front of me, its own star which swells and explodes. You're safe. I open my eyes. I'm standing outside of the house, facing the thick brush covering its front facade again. I look up and see Mrs. Dalby in the window. 
We stare at each other for a moment and then hold up our hands, wave. <laughs> and then Mrs. Dalby takes a step back and dissipates into the darkness of the empty bedroom. I stand there, silent, smiling, relieved that I made a new imaginary friend today who helped me ease my fear and my pain. I listen to the grandeur of the Atlantic Ocean harmonizing with the rumble of the cars on North Carolina State Highway 12. The hum of the voices of the people, their windows rolled down, laughing, alive, listening to Crosby, Stills, and Nash's sweet Judy blue eyes, blasting up into the atmosphere and out across the galaxy. Softly, I join in. Remember what we've said and done and felt about each other. Oh, babe, have mercy. Don't let the past remind us of what we are. If you're just tuning in, welcome to the second season of Abandoned, the All-American Ruins podcast. Join me every other week as I take you on an immersive sonic journey, recounting my expeditions of abandoned spaces across the United States, which I transform into fantastical audio experiences that allow you, dear listener, to dive into my imagination with me, or maybe inspire you to go out and use your own. Next time... On the eastern shores of Virginia, join me at an abandoned school, a monument to FDR's Works Progress Administration. If you don't want to miss it, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please subscribe, rate, and review. And if you've already done it, my goodness, thank you so much. If you're a hugger and we see each other in public sometime, let's hug it out. Also, if you like to read or enjoy amateur photography, just know that each episode of this season is adapted from the original All American Ruins blog, where you can catch up on more of my adventures. Just visit allamericanruins.com or follow me on Instagram at allamericanruins. Abandoned, the All American Ruins podcast is hosted, written, edited, and produced by me, Blake File with studio space courtesy of Radio Kingston, WKNY, AM 1490, FM 1079 in Kingston, New York. Special thanks to Ida Hakala, Jimmy Buff, and Manuel Bloss for the resources and encouragement. Carrie Donahue and the faculty at the SUNY Stony Brook Audio Podcast Fellowship for the mentorship and guidance. To you, the listener, for taking the time to explore these abandoned spaces with me, and Mrs. Dalby. I am so glad we met.